Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we will return to the times when jet planes just started conquering the sky above us. Our today's hero was not a revolution. It was not the largest or the fastest, but it did not prevent it from becoming one of the most important machines of its time. Douglas DC-9 is a twin-engine narrow-body jet airliner created by the Douglas Aircraft Company in the early 1960s. The airplane was very successful. Not only was it produced for 17 years, it also became the basis for its airs, the MD-80 and MD-90, as well as, to a certain degree, the Boeing 717. Decades in series and thousands of planes. Not a bad legacy. Let's see how it all began. The history of this aircraft started in the 1950s, as always, with some noise. The air transportation industry was experiencing a real boom. The number of flights, passengers and everything attached to them was growing at a frantic pace. Plus, the planes themselves were quickly changing, getting rid of piston motors and being equipped with jet and turboprop engines. Soon they were already flying around the world, and in the United States clashed all the major aviation companies, the leaders of which of course were Boeing with their flagship model 707 and Douglas with their pride, the DC-8. These planes were awesome. They were large, could accommodate many passengers and fly very far. However, they were only doing part of the overall work. The flagships were expensive and difficult to operate, and their performance was often unnecessary. More than 60% of all flights in the United States were regional, with ranges of about 500 miles and a small number of passengers on airplanes. These flights were still operated by old piston planes. Naturally, in the late 1950s, aviators started creating their replacements. Boeing settled on a three-engine configuration. A massive amount of studies and a small affair with de Havilland and their project DH-121 Trident brought results. By 1963, the guys from Seattle made their newest airliner, the Boeing 727. Douglas was a little behind, but was not going to give in. Their search for the best configuration was more complicated. Great experience in creating piston aircraft was pulling in its direction. A lot of people were inclined to creating a turboprop airliner, something closer to the DC-7. This was an option. The British and Soviet turboprops showed themselves pretty good. Lockheed recently presented their L-188 Electra and, at short distances, the turboprop could be more economical. But the race for technology was not letting go. It was decided that the future aircraft must be a jet. Initially, options were presented of locating the engines under the wing, four or two. They were very pretty, but the airlines were not impressed. Four engines under the wing of a small, medium hull plane is not justified, and two engines in the same situation is risky. Yes, there was a time when the 737 index did not mean anything. Research continued at a fast pace, and in the end, the Americans turned their attention to their overseas counterparts. In 1959, the Scandinavian airline SAS made its first commercial flight on the Sudovietion Caravelle. Ah, Caravelle, the symbol and love of the entire Europe. Simple design, clean wing, tail engines in individual nacelles, great advantages in comfort, in economy, in piloting. While well, aviators from different countries, recognizing the success of French engineers, cheerfully dragged their innovations into their own projects, Douglas realized that they didn't want an airplane with some solutions of the caravel. They wanted the whole caravel. The opportunity to get it soon appeared. The market as huge as the United States is not easy to ignore. For the Americans, Sudovich Young created the Caravel 10A version. It was an aircraft of the 7th series, with slightly modified structural elements and a number of other systems. Plus, the engines were local. A pair of General Electric CJ805, yes, the ones with the fan in the back, that were placed on the Convair 990 airliners. This miracle was lifted into the air in 1962, and for some time, Douglas and Sudovetsion were working together, but it didn't work out. The Americans and the French could not agree on the measure of localization of production in the United States. Customers were not in a hurry to buy an airplane with an uncertain fate, and similar second-generation airliners started appearing in the world. Douglas risked investing a lot of effort and making a lot of compromises for the sake of a rapidly aging aircraft. As a result, the cooperation was not continued. In 1962, Douglas started the creation of a new aircraft, with solutions of the caravel, but completely on their own. Meanwhile, I have to note that nobody was going to directly compete with the 727, which was just about to take off. 
The Boeing was equipped with three engines, weighed more than 70 tons and accommodated up to 130 passengers. Douglas wanted to create just a small regional plane with two engines, capacity up to 100 people and a range of almost two times less than that of the new Boeing – 1300 nautical miles versus 2200. In addition, unlike the maximum unification of the models 727 and 707, Douglas made their aircraft from scratch with almost completely new set of elements. So let's see what they created. The aircraft, that soon became known as the Douglas Commercial DC-9, had a low wing with a moderate sweep, a T-tail and a pair of the engines in the rear of the fuselage. This scheme was a hit of the season. Already in 1963 took to the skies the British BAC-111 and the Soviet Tu-134, which were made the same way and were also very interesting machines. The wing, thanks to the transfer of engines to the tail, remained as clean as possible, but being created for the new generation of jetliners, it was equipped better than, for example, the Caravelle. More complex outlines gave better aerodynamics. Mechanization was initially represented by ailerons, interceptors and large flaps, and in subsequent modifications also by slats, stretching along almost the entire length. The tail is classic for such aircraft shaped with a large stabilizer of a slightly increased sweep. The design of the airframe was worked out rather quickly, but a number of adjustments had to be made after the crash of the BAC-111 prototype in October 1963. During the tests, the plane encountered the phenomenon of deep stall, when at large angles of attack, the T-tail falls into the aerodynamic shadow of the wing and engines and, in fact, becomes completely ineffective. Plus, the test showed that at low speeds the wing itself loses stability of lift. All aviators faced with these problems solved them more or less the same way. They optimized the design and enlarged the tail. The air currents on the wing were stabilized by wing fences. Classic. Douglas, however, went further and equipped the front edges with small attachments, vartilons. A little exotic, but gets the job done. The plane is equipped with a three-leg landing gear. Since it had to be able to work with rather bad runways, the legs were reinforced and the pressure in the wheels was slightly reduced. But given a good takeoff and landing performance and the mass of about 40 tons, there was no need for special tricks, just simple classic gears. The DC-9 power plant is represented by a pair of Pratt Whitney JT-8D turbofan engines, many of their modifications depending on the version of the aircraft. The engine thrust, of course, also varied, from 54 to 71 kilonewtons. The engines were installed in separate nacelles on the rear of the fuselage. For the original jets, it was the best option for that time. The Caravelle had proven everything. The external suspension reduced the noise in the cabin, and the high location protected against debris on the airfield. The engines, by the way, were the same as those of the Boeing 727, but the use of two instead of three gave the best economy, although it limited the mass of the aircraft and did not allow flying over the seas. ETOPS was already there, and it was severe. The regulators did not allow twin-engine aircraft to fly far from airfields in case of failures, which were not uncommon. Flights to the Caribbean and Hawaii remained the prerogative of Boeing. The bonus of the aircraft was the appearance of a full auxiliary power unit. Considering that the plane was supposed to serve mainly in regional transportation, it was highly likely that there wouldn't be much ground-based infrastructure on site. The APU was essential. Let's go inside. The fuselage received a diameter of 3.34 meters, or 131 inches. Less than that of the flagships, but for the regional airliner it is normal even in our time. This diameter was enough to accommodate five seats in a row, according to the scheme 3 plus 2. The original DC-9, later named Series 10, was almost 32 meters, or 104 feet long, and accommodated 90 passengers, with a certified limit of 109. Entrance to the cabin was executed through two doors, in the front of the fuselage or through the tail, with integrated air stairs. Technically, in terms of performance, it was a competitor of the British BAC-111, which had similar dimensions and capacity. They had one more thing in common, the incredibly developed avionics and piloting complex. Thanks to introduction of the latest technologies and violent disputes with aviation regulators, Douglas managed to prove that a rather light regional plane could manage with a smaller crew. Yes, the DC-9 cockpit was designed for two pilots. Not bad for the mid-1960s. The DC-9 prototype made its maiden flight in February 1965. 
Since Douglas was lagging behind the rest of the aviation companies, the work was carried out very intensively. Fortunately, it was possible to learn from mistakes of the competitors. Five planes participated in the test program at once, and they passed certification in less than a year. In December 1965, the first serious plane in the Delta Airlines livery completed its first flight. Shortly after entering the market, the DC-9 gained love and popularity among carriers. Naturally, such a series could not do without a whole bunch of modifications. So, the first model was just the DC-9, named a bit later Series 10. These were the basic, smallest and simplest aircraft. In the series there were models 11, 12, 14 and 15, plus, since 1967, the cargo versions. Series 13 was not developed, not a good number. The aircraft had a length of about 32 meters, or 104 feet, and a takeoff weight of up to 42 tons, 90,000 pounds. A total of 137 units were made, including the very first one delivered to Delta. In 1968, the first representative of Series 20 flew into the sky. This aircraft was a hybrid of the basic Model 10 and the larger Model 30. It received the fuselage of the first, the enlarged wing of the second, and boosted engines, which significantly improved its takeoff and landing performance, making it possible to work with short runways. Initially, these planes were made for Scandinavian airlines, and they were delivered, although did not become best sellers. The Series 30 was developed in parallel and was an enlarged version of the basis, plus almost 5 meters in length and plus more than 1 meter in wingspan. Since the aircraft with engines in the tail suffer from rearward displacement of the center of mass, the DC-9 was elongated mainly in the front section. The capacity reached 115 passengers in a single class layout. The aircraft was more technologically advanced than the basic model. It received more powerful engines, updated equipment, and flight performance of the heavier airliner remained at a higher level due to introduction of slats. A total of 662 planes were delivered, the most of the entire DC-9 fleet. The Series 30 was Douglas's response to the newly created Boeing 737, and it was a worthy competitor, at least in the beginning. Later in 1968, another version flew to the Scandinavians, the Series 40. It was based on the Model 30, but had an even longer fuselage, accommodating 125 people in one economy class cabin. Its mass exceeded 50 tons, or 114,000 pounds, and the engines reached the thrust of 69 to 71 kilonewtons, depending on configuration. 71 planes were made, not much, but not bad either. The coolest DC-9 was the Series 50, 40 meters, or 133 feet long, an updated larger wing and a maximum weight of almost 55 tons, or 121,000 pounds. It was heavier than the basis aircraft by a third. It's curious that the regulators allowed to keep the two-member crew. Initially, Douglas got permission for the aircraft almost twice as light. Besides, the capacity reached 135 passengers, with a range of 2400 kilometers, or 1300 nautical miles, not mentioning the new cabin, improved equipment and top engines with reverse thrust. The plane went to Eastern Airlines fleet in 1975, and McDonnell Douglas, yes, then already McDonnell Douglas, delivered 96 units. Of course, we can't forget about the military options. The McDonnell Douglas C-9 Nightingale was produced under the contract with the US Air Force, plus the C-9B Skytrain II for the Navy and Marines. A total of 48 aircraft were delivered in medical and cargo passenger configurations, by now already decommissioned, unfortunately. On this, the description of the DC-9 modifications can be limited, although of course I can't not mention that already in the early 1970s, the company was actively working on the creation of the DC-9 based aircraft which was much more advanced than the Series 50. The result of this work was launched in 1979 as the MD-80 airliner. Despite the DC-9 basis, it introduced so many changes and innovations that the aircraft was described as new, so we will talk about it separately. A total of 967 aircraft were produced. Most of the deliveries happened in the late 1960s, when McDonnell Douglas was producing more than 100 planes a year. In terms of flight safety, the DC-9 was not a champion. During the period of mass operation, the aircraft were involved in 276 accidents, with 145 aircraft lost, taking 3,697 lives. 
Yeah, not a very rosy figure, but again, more or less close to his classmates. Meanwhile, the concept of original airliner of such an arrangement had lost popularity over the decades, yielding to the aircraft with engines under the wing. If we assume that the DC-9, MD-80, MD-90 and Boeing 717 belong to one large family in several generations, then their total number will reach 2,441 units. A huge figure, but still, much inferior to the Boeing 737 and Airbus A320. In other countries it was the same. The French and British made several hundred of their airliners, while the DC-9 is close in numbers only to the 2134. About 850 of those planes were built. The basic aircraft became outdated, but continued to be actively operated, because despite all the competition with the new models, they were showing themselves quite well, were not demanding and had good economy. Several major American airlines, including Delta Airlines, used them very actively until the beginning of the 21st century. Their enthusiasm was cooled by the sharp jump in fuel prices, and the planes nevertheless started being quickly withdrawn from the parts. The Boeing 737NG and Airbus A319 models, which were close in terms of performance, had much better fuel efficiency and were considered superior to the old guy in terms of noise and ecology. But I will note again, Delta, in the face of fierce competition, continued to successfully operate the airliners until 2014. Even now several operators continue using a couple dozen machines in cargo versions and on charters. For an airplane created in the 1960s, this is a golden medal. Such is the tale of the first Douglas regional jet. Its path was continued by its heirs, but that's completely another story. And this is all we've got for today. Fast flights and soft landings to you.